Uh, this is actually our uh, second uh, series exploring disability history that we've hosted, um, and um, it, it's been uh, a great experience. We're only able to host these programs um, thanks to the support of our members and donors, and we hope that if you enjoy our program this evening, you'll consider uh, joining MHS or becoming a, a supporter in some way. Uh, so we have a wonderful program this evening, um, and uh, I'm going to briefly uh, introduce introduce our speakers uh, and, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to our uh, host who will be running the rest of the panel. Uh, our host is Ola Ojewumi. Um, she is a, a graduate from the University of Maryland uh, with a bachelor's degree in government and politics. Uh, as a student, she founded two nonprofits, the Sacred Hearts Children Tra Children's Transplant Foundation and Project Ascend. These organizations provide college uh, scholarships to low-income students, funding for women's education programs, and distribute teddy bears and books to children awaiting organ transplants across the United States. Uh, as a public speaker, she has uh, worked with MoveOn.org, Planned Parenthood, and Healthcare Voter. Uh, she will be joined by um, a number of panelists, including Beth Linker, uh, who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the Department of History and Sociology of Science. Her research and teaching interests include the history of science and medicine, disability, health policy, and gender. She is the author of War's Waste, Rehabilitation in World War I, uh, which went on to be featured in a Rick Burns documentary titled A Debt of Honor. Uh, Linker is also the co-editor of Civil Disabilities, Citizenship, Membership, and Belonging. Her writing has also appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Boston Globe, the Huffington Post, the Bulletin of History of Medicine, and the American Journal of Public Health. Uh, and I'm just giving the speakers an alphabetical order, not necessarily the order in which they will appear. Uh, Marla Mills is an associate professor of medicine, culture, and communications at New York University with expertise in sound studies, disability studies, business history, the history of electronics, and the history of the telephone. Uh, her book, Hearing Loss and the History of Information Theory, is forthcoming. Uh, she is also currently working uh, on the history of optical character recognition and co-authoring a book titled uh, Tuning Time, Histories of Sound and Speed. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased today to present you with our great panelists and this great discussion we're going to have about history. We'll go ahead and start with the presenters. And first up, we have, who's first? Um, I think we'll, should we go um, chronologically, in which, case, in which case I'll go first since I have the earliest um, moment in time. So I have to say I've been admiring the Mass Historical Society's online programming related to disability since the start of the pandemic, and I'm really delighted to now get to be part of a round table with Beth. So I was invited to talk about Thomas Edison's deafness. And I have to say that requires dispensing with a number of myths related to his hearing loss and also its relation to his inventiveness. While I was working on the history of hearing aids a few years ago, I spent some time at the Edison archive in New Jersey, and it turned out to be an important repository for disability history beyond um, Edison himself partly as a consequence of the massive unsolicited correspondence Edison's fame encouraged. His archive contains the letters of hundreds of deaf and hard of hearing people around the world who wrote to him about their hopes, fears, and experiences in particular with electrical technologies. Edison alternately described himself in his correspondence as deaf, partially deaf, half deaf, and hard of hearing. What did deaf mean in those days? For centuries, deaf and deafness and hearing were understood to be something like a binary, but this shifted into a spectrum of uh, different kinds of hearing loss in the early 20th century for three main reasons. The development of electronic audiometry, the creation of an audiogram or so-called normal curve for hearing, and the development of electrical and then vacuum tube um, hearing aids, which allowed people who might previously have been called deaf to hear some sounds. The very first commercial electronic audiometer in the US was built at Bell Telephone Labs in 1920, 
1882, and Edison himself was one of the very first to visit the labs, then located in New York near the current Whitney Museum for an audiometric exam. At the time, Edison knew that he was deaf in his left ear and hard of hearing in his right ear, ear although he used many different labels, as I said, for himself. And he was delighted when Harvey Fletcher, the head of speech and hearing research at the labs, told him that his hearing loss in the right ear was evenly distributed across the frequency range because he believed that meant that he was still a good judge of distortion in recorded sound. His staff had been accusing him for years of misinterpreting the quality of the phonograph records they pressed. As Fletcher's son recalled, a quote, Edison would hold one end of a morning glory horn against a phonograph loudspeaker. The other end was fitted with a rubber tube, which he fitted into his ear. In this way, he passed or rejected every record that was sold. After Edison's audiometric exam, his foreman also visited Bell Labs to have his own hearing tested. He wanted to prove to Edison that he had better hearing and should be the final judge of the recordings. But as it turned out, that man had a loss of hearing above 2000 Hertz. What this tells us is that hearing loss was, as it still is, incredibly common. There's a myth about Edison um, that he lost his hearing from being boxed in the ears as a child as a punishment after setting fire in a train. But we know from the archives that he probably had familial hearing loss because both his father and his son Charles experienced similar hearing impairment. Charles endorsed various hearing aids throughout his life. And on this slide, I have a picture of um, Charles on the a white man in a suit on the cover of Better Hearing um, magazine advertising for Zenith. Edmund Morris's recent biography opens with a discussion of Edison's obituaries, many of which marveled, and this is a quote, that an acoustic revolution adding a whole new dimension to human memory could have been accomplished by a man half deaf in one ear and wholly deaf in another. Edison invented well over 200 acoustic devices, the phonograph dictating machines, acoustic clocks, talking dolls, and many more. He also worked on visual technology, famously light bulbs and silent film, but the press repeatedly mentioned his deafness with regard to sonic inventions in the mode we now describe as supercrip rhetoric praise for either overcoming or having special powers because of a disability. Despite his long list of acoustic patents, there's another myth that Edison never tried to invent hearing aids himself. That isn't true. The slide I'm showing right now is an image of um, what looks like a telescope, but it was a telephonoscope, and that's what I'm describing right now in Edison of uh, an Edison invention. It's a little like hand-drawn sketch. So it's not true that Edison never tried to invent hearing aids, um, even though there's a myth about that. For, you know, an early example is 1878, when he attached a seven foot funnel to a speaking trumpet and found that he could broadcast speech two miles. He called that device a megaphone and he believed its function could be reversed to serve as a telescopophone. Um, to detect faraway sounds. He, in, in an 1878 circular that he mailed to his colleagues, he discussed a plan to adapt these instruments into a hearing aid. And he wrote, I have now two assistants engaged at my laboratory in experimenting upon an apparatus for the benefit of the deaf. The results so far have been quite satisfactory. The only drawback as yet is the large size of the apparatus. This was not portable. Perhaps more importantly, the carbon transmitter Edison invented as a telephone amplifier enabled the electrical hearing aid industry to come into being um, in the first place, even if he did not successfully market an electrical hearing aid himself, although he experimented with them. He attributed this carbon transmitter for the telephone, um, which later migrated into hearing aids to his own hearing loss. He wrote, when Bell first worked out his telephone idea, I tried it and the sound which came through the instrument was so weak, I couldn't hear it. 
I started to develop it and I continued until the sounds were audible to me. The telephone as we know it may have been delayed if a deaf electrician had not undertaken the job of making it a practical thing. Edison also um, wrote in his notes that he had, quote, tried a great many experiments with electrical hearing aids. None have been sufficiently satisfactory to make a commercial introduction. However, there are many examples in the Edison archives of everyday user experiences with aids developed by other inventors that integrated Edison's carbon um, mic transmitter. By my count, in the first decade of the 20th century, a letter arrived every week or two for Edison on the topic of electrical hearing aids from deaf and hard of hearing people around the world. Miss Letty Watkins, writing from Oakland in November 1920, described her, quote, problems with street use of a carbon transmitter with all other sounds besides speech being magnified, the continued problem of background noise. And Gordon Bloomfield, to give you just one other example of Sinclairville, New York, wrote in August 1919 of the distortion caused by the electrical aids themselves. I have tried the miniature telephones, he wrote, that one carries around in the pocket. They give every voice a new kind of foreign brogue and of music they make a confused medley. In response to letters such as these, Edison generally recommended that hard of hearing people try the acousticon model of electrical aid or just stick with an old fashioned horn, ear trumpet. In response to a letter from Frank Curtis of Indiana in January, 1916, Edison wrote, I use a horn such as were used some years ago. If you can get the horn, which should be two feet long or thereabouts, I will send you an earpiece. By placing the mouth of the horn against the face of a phonograph, you should hear at least the band and dance music. It is often also said that Edison never used an electrical hearing aid himself, but in his archives, there's abundant evidence to the contrary. He used the ear trumpet and electrical aids simultaneously. So after his hearing test, Harvey Fletcher of Bell Labs built a customized aid for him and brought it to Edison's office. Its components were packed into a foot long case attached to a microphone and headset. It was portable. Edison used this aid for several years, carrying it to dinner parties and lecture events. He reported back to Fletcher, with the hearing aid, I can hear and understand the speaker, but usually I find it so dull, I turn it off and turn my thoughts to my inventions. Um, the photo I have here, I came across and it, with no explanation of a larger electronic aid made for Edison. It looks like a large, maybe five foot tall black box on wheels with um, radio kinds of knobs. Edison was also interested in testing other kinds of aids. His assistant wrote a letter to inventor Hugo Gernsbach in January, 1920, regarding one of his quote, inventions for assisting the hearing of deaf persons. Mr. Edison would be very glad to try it out for himself. Okay. This could have been the, the physiophone among many things that Gernsbach worked on um, pictured here. This used a microphone to transform the sound from a record player into electrical current, then passed to charged me metal handles. Here those handles are hanging from a wheel on a ceiling. <sighs> Gernsbach predicted that deaf people in the future would wear similar, um, oh, I should say, by grasping these handles, a listener could experience physiological music as a pattern of electrical shocks. These people are hol um, holding onto the handles and dancing around in um, a parlor room. Gernsbach predicted that deaf people in the future would wear similar metallic receivers um, to receive um, shock <laughs> speech as electrical shocks. And then Edison's manuscripts are also filled with many examples of other ways he learned to communicate um, beyond his hearing and, and, and beyond amplification. So for instance, William Terry's grandson mailed a touch alphabet pamphlet to him in 1916, to which Edison replied, it's quite an ingenious system, but I can read Morse at a rate of 35 words per minute by touch only. Edison's wife translated speeches and plays into Morse on his knee, and Edison tapped his marriage proposal on her hand, delighting in the merger of speed with intimacy. He, he writes about their tactile communication. The word yes is an easy one to send by Morse signals, and she sent it. If she had been obliged to speak, she might have found it harder. 
Finally, Edison's correspondence also reveals the abundant lay expertise and inventiveness of deaf and hard of hearing people who had far fewer resources than him and whose names and ideas have been lost to history. This is the disappeared <laughs> disabilities is the theme of our event today. People wrote to Edison not only to request advice or to ask him to build devices on their behalf, but to send in their own plans for new and improved amplifiers. I'm showing here a slide with just a sketch on letter sheet um, of um, that's very imp an Im informal engineering sketch of, of a hearing aid amplifier. These are very common across his correspondence. Um, William Shaw of Lynn, Massachusetts was um, locally known as a deaf experimenter and General Electric employee who also wrote to Edison. He made everything from heating devices to a deaf mute's telephone which was something like teletype or proto email. He attached a typewriter to a phone line as a sender with a board um, and letters that lit up in sequence um, at the receiver. Edison um, invited Shaw in 1912 to work in his lab in New Jersey and Shaw indeed moved there. Five years later, he invited Shaw to establish, quote, a room where a number of deaf mutes might be employed. This is um, a news clipping called Want Deaf Mutes in Edison Plant. In January 19, Shaw wrote in this news announcement, they have a certain kind of light work in the Edison laboratory for which only deaf mutes are wanted. They plan to begin with a few to see how the plan will turn out, but they will employ a hundred or more by summer if the plan is successful. For unknown reasons, which Shaw simply described as friction in his correspondence, the plan for a team of deaf um, employees working with Edison fell apart by February and Shaw moved back to Massachusetts. I end on this note as a reminder that Edison does not represent all deaf people of his time. He even had vexed relations with some of his deaf colleagues. So to tell the story of Edison's deafness is to tell a story of deaf fame and technical elitism, a story of disappeared disabilities, sometimes caused by disabled people in power. Thank you so much, Mara. I'm so inspired by that. And as a person with a disability, I didn't get to mention this before, but I'm a survivor of a heart and kidney transplant and a wheelchair user. I feel like it is so important that disabled people had the opportunity to hear their history told, though history has taken a great time, a, a long time, to essentially erase disability from the discussion. And what MHS is doing here is finally bringing visibility to disabled people. So we can not only be inspired, but know that achievement is not impossible simply because you have a disability. Uh, perhaps Beth could uh, speak next. Yeah, happy to do that. Thank you, Ola. Thank you, Gavin, Olivia, and thank you to the Massachusetts Historical Society for um, these series. Um, it's great to be on this panel. So my talk is um, focuses on um, John F. Kennedy. Um, and I should say from the outset, since I am giving a talk at a Massachusetts institution. I am not a John a JFK expert. Um, this is um, only a brief glimpse into his life, um, but I think it's still an interesting way to think about, to reframe our understanding of John F. Kennedy. And if you can all see the, I hope you can see the photo of, this is in the, on my title slide. This is a photo of John F. Kennedy in a um, back brace. It was a canvas corset that he liked to wear. And in this photo, he's sitting in a chair um, wearing this back brace. So I'd like to begin briefly with the president that I think most people associate with a disability. Um, I think if you ask most people, have there been a, has there been a disabled president, you know, in the United States, most people would point to FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Roosevelt who was paralyzed from the waist down um, from polio. Now, FDR, we know from scholars, um, historians, 
uh, one book called The Splendid Deception, which I think captures it quite well, is that FDR didn't try to hide his disability. Um, he would, all of his events were staged. It would require the coordination of secret service, close confidants, and the press all had to work together to orchestrate his image as non-disabled. Um, and so for the most part, the staging worked um, for many of the US citizens who were alive during his presidency. Now, of course, we can talk about media differences, right? That the image media didn't exist then as it does now. Um, but it's important to note that it wasn't really FDR, we can talk about this in the Q&A, did, did he identify as disabled or not? I think he identified as a polio survivor. Um, so, but as we see in this, the, this slide, there's one black and white photo of um, FDR in his wheelchair uh, with a, his dog and uh, a child standing next to him. The image on the right is um, a more recent image, a color photograph um, from 2009 of a white middle-aged woman in a wheelchair posing next to the FDR Memorial in Washington, DC. So part of the reason why you know, the, the known disabled president, the non-disappeared <laughs> disabled president, part of the reason that's made possible is that it's been put into a monument. Um, and we can talk about that as well, because that has its own history. Um, but I want to talk a little bit today about the unknown disabled president, and I put it as a question mark, um, because, again, happy to discuss, um, but John F. Kennedy. So the Kennedy family, their relationship to disability was a fraught and paradoxical paradoxical one. The eldest child, Rosemary, was considered the disabled member of the family, not John. By the time that JFK was elected president, Rosemary had been lobotomized 20 years earlier and was living full-time in a Wisconsin institution. Also during JFK's presidency, his sister Eunice Eunice was in the initial stages of creating a summer camp for the intellectually disabled children, leading to the eventual founding of the Special Olympics. Their father, Joseph Kennedy, had wished to keep the family an arm's length distance from Rosemary or any hint of disability in the family. Mainly, Joseph Kennedy worried about ruining John's career, political career. And yet JFK lived with many chronic health conditions, such as Addison's disease and spastic colitis, to name just but a few. And he had chronic low back pain for most of his adult life, a condition that I would like to focus on this evening. And I'd like to make a bold claim here. If polio was one of the most well-known disabilities in the early 20th century, low back pain took its place by the late, mid to late 20th century. After World War II, physicians and public health experts noticed a drastic uptick in low back pain, a phenomenon that was placing an outsized burden on the US's rather meager disability welfare programs. So Kennedy's experience with low back pain did very little to normalize the condition in large part because he hid it from public view. So let me give you a little history of Kennedy and his back pain. So he struggled with back pain since his 20s, since he was 20. By the time of his presidential inauguration in January of 1961, he had already undergone three back surgeries. In 1944, at the age of 27, was his first surgery. He underwent a discectomy as a result of sustaining an injury during his World War II service in the Natal, Naval Reserve. Um, so this was removing a disc from his spine, which was fairly uh, high-tech surgery at that time. I should also say that he was um, a member of the Naval Reserve 
because his family was able to manage to get him into it. For all intents and purposes, if John F. Kennedy were an average citizen, he would have been rejected by the medical draft boards because he was not healthy enough to serve in the war. But his family, having high hopes for his political career, managed to get him into the armed services. So that was in 1944. Ten years later, when he was a U.S. senator and still experiencing chronic back pain, he underwent a lumbosacral fusion operation and then had a third follow-up surgery in 1955 to remove the implanted hardware from the fusion since it was causing a life-threatening staph infection. In the slide that we have here, you see Kennedy on his crutches on the left. That was from this era in his uh, Senate, his congressional era. His entire congressional career from 1946 to 1960 was marked, according to those closest to him, by a near constant use of crutches, at least when he was out of the public eye. As one political advisor recalled, quote, when he came into the room where a crowd was gathered, he was erect and smiling, looking as fit and healthy as the light heavyweight champion of the world. Then after he finished his speech and answered questions from the floor and shook hands with anyone, everyone, we would help him to the car and he would lean back on the seat and close his eyes in pain. Five months into his presidency, so in May 1961, Kennedy injured his back again after he shoveled several spades full of dirt into a ceremonial tree in Ottawa, Canada. So again, this was a simple, you know, he wasn't actually doing heavy shoveling, but he did shovel one spade full of dirt. And this caused um, an acute back pain episode for him. He was still in considerable pain that summer when JFK met with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. This was the Vienna su summit, and it was a conference intended to de-escalate Cold War tensions. According to most analysts at the time, the summit was a failure. Um, a month after the summit, East Germany began construction of the Berlin Wall. Certain social commentators blamed the escalation of Cold War tensions on JFK's poor performance at the summit. Now, this was not popular opinion. Um, this has become more the opin opinion retrospectively once historians and became more better aware of um, JFK's back pain. Kennedy's back pain eventually became managed through the effort of a posture guru, Hans Krauss, whom I discuss in my forthcoming book, Slouch. Um, my book is about uh, a posture panic and the making of, a, of an epidemic. Um, I chart how in the 20th century, um, there was a creation of a poor posture epidemic. And that led to a disability awareness program and disability prevention program. Um, I can speak more about that in the Q&A if anybody wants to talk about posture. So <clears throat> Kennedy's pain got better in 1961, um, but he continued to wear the back brace uh, against medical advice. Kennedy liked this canvas corset because it not only offered support, but it had the added benefit of making him look taller, allowing him to sit and stand straighter than he would otherwise. Kennedy was wearing the lumbar brace on the fateful day that he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963. Certain physician experts have conjectured that the ability of his brace to promote an upright posture may have ultimately cost him his life. Without the brace, Kennedy may have more naturally slumped forward after the first bullet um, to his neck and thus avoided the second bullet, which was a direct and deadly shot to his head. So I'd like to <clears throat> switch gears and talk about the reluctance to categorize JFK as disabled. I think it represents um, 
ongoing cultural ambivalences towards back pain and towards categorizing back pain as a disability. So some questions maybe perhaps for discussion would be, did JFK see himself as disabled? Why or why not? Um, who can make their disabilities disappear and pass as non-disabled? And how did JFK's condition and its disappearance affect cultural thinking about disability? I'm gonna offer just a few thoughts on each of these questions. The question about if JFK saw himself as disabled, why and why not? I think personally, he was in a lot of debilitating pain. Um, I don't think he would have considered himself disabled. That was a legalistic category. And also it had such stigma. Um, you know, this was the um, Camelot president um, who liked to perform masculinity and strength and disability was seen as a weakness. And this brings me to who can make their disabilities disappear and pass as non-disabled. There's a hierarchy of entitlement when it comes to disability. I think at the top of this hierarchy are those who live with disability, but who have the means to pass as non-disabled. So JFK could, had a team of medical experts um, who could treat him, who could help him manage his pain, um, who could get him his food, who could drive him places. Um, so he had the means to pass as non-disabled. Um, usually disability, especially in the 20th century, is defined a lot by can you work or not. Kennedy was able to work, although thinking about the Khrushchev and the Vienna summit, it seems to have impeded his work. Um, and so again, if he were an independently employed person, I don't think he would have been as effective. He had a team of advisors to help him pass as non-disabled. Second in the hierarchy, so one notch below those who have the means to pass as non-disabled, are those who live with disability and have the means to get the medical and welfare system to categorize themselves as such and receive entitlements and benefits. So people who have the time and the means to apply for SSDI and so forth. And then there are those who live with a disability that it, it are unrecognized by the state. So people who might not have means to see a doctor, to see a psychologist, to see these people who control the definition at a state level of disability. And finally, on the theme of disappeared disability. So if Kennedy kept his condition out of the public eye and therefore one could argue that it was a disappearance. How does it, how did it affect cultural thinking about disability in the 60s? And this is right before the disability rights movement would really come to fore. JFK is known for creating the President's Council on Physical Fitness. Maybe some of you as old as I on this call remember this President's Council on Physical Fitness. And in my book, I argue that in many ways, it was a disability pre prevention program. Um, all of the calisthenics, it was intended to prevent heart disease, to prevent obesity, to prevent poor posture, to prevent lung disease, and the list goes on. I think also JFK's hidden history of back pain ended up strengthening the binary between intellectual, mental disabilities and physical disabilities. I think probably in JFK's mind and in this era, the former, so the intellectual disabilities were more of a real disability, so his sister, Rosemary. And the latter is something to be prevented and managed through individual discipline. Finally, he met, he, promoted a view that back pain should be understood within the medical model. Um, he, because of his back pain and all of his team of um, physicians who treated him, many of these physicians were university researchers. So in the Kennedy era, we get a lot of back, low back pain research centers. 
Um, and yet at the same time, at the same time, you see statistics um, post-World War II um, with medical practitioners also concerned about the uptick in low back pain. And still to this day, if you look at certain statistics, low back pain is one of the leading uh, causes of disability. So with that, I will open it up to, I'll, I'll hand it back to Ola. Well, thank you so much for your presentation and remarks. And that monument um, that you showed earlier is very important to the disabled community. I grew up in the Washington DC metropolitan area. And I, I have visited the monument with, with friends and colleagues. And what, what should be noted is that a lot, of, a lot of disabled activists fought for that monument, but also fought for wheels to be placed on that monument for FDR. Um, when you visit the monument, the wheels are so tiny, you can barely see them. So there's been a lot of disability erasure within recognizing past presidents with disabilities. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that. Let's see what questions we have thus far. Please feel free to write your questions in the chat and I will ask our panelists. We could also start with um, just a question, uh, Beth and, and Mara. Um, you know, in your research on this, what, what did you find most surprising in terms of uh, the ways in which disabilities were, were hidden or, or were not discussed? Was there uh, anything that really sort of uh, startled you in, in, in your research? I mean, I think with the Edison case, the hiding, it's more, it's more a case of either obfuscation or mythologization. There's too much information that is incorrect about Edison's deafness because he was, he has a huge archive. It's a national park and he was such a famous inventor, the most famous American inventor in his time period. So his de his own deafness was not hidden at all. It was constantly mentioned in the press. But as I tried to show in my talk, almost everything that was mentioned is not true and not corroborated by what's actually in the archive. So it's less of a case of, um, you know, of uncovering a, a hidden disability than telling an accurate story about a disability that's been like plastered over with, with mythology. And this, this, this is a kind of um, dynamic that um, Sharon Snyder and David Mitchell have written about um, with regard to disability as well, that it's it's not always a case of something that's hidden, but it's it, disability is often everywhere. But to get to the true story, you have to get beyond um, a lot of myth and metaphor and problematic rhetoric. And that's for me, that's certainly what happened in the Edison archives. I have another question. It's from the chat, um, but I'll ask both questions. Uh, one person is asking, Edison had two wives. Which one did he propose using touch, te touch language to, if you're aware of that? That's a good question. And I don't know, I actually have written about this in an article I published about 10 years ago. So it's been so long that I don't remember the name of his wife, if he even mentioned it in that, that document. Um, if you write to me, I can send you the source for that. And you might be able to correlate it time-wise. But for me, that example is an important counter to the relentless amplification and sound technology story that surrounds Edison's deafness because he was just as invested in tactile technology and, and visual technology as, as in sonic and, um, and in amplification. This is a question for Beth. Can you tell us more about posture history? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I could spend hours talking about posture history. Um, the brief of it is that um, it became uh, an epidemic um, after Darwin, and when you get evolutionary theories saying that uh, human beings descended uh, directly from um, apes, and that what happened first was that people stood up, the first uh, human being stood up uh, and then developed intellectual capacity. Prior to that, most evolutionary theories thought it was intellectual capacity 
um, evolved first and then human beings stood up. So it put a lot of emphasis on posture. Um, and so I trace um, the poor posture epidemic, which intersects with racial politics, gender politics, and disability quite a lot, um, and how it moves throughout the 20th century. So the outbreak of the of the epidemic is this kind of these new evolutionary theories, and then it spreads. In my book, I talk about how it spreads in the commercial marketplace. So braces, uh, posture queen contest, charm contests, exercise fitness chairs, you name it. Um, so, and in the end, I, I think it's still with us. We just don't have it as documented and, and you'll have to read the book, um, to see why it's not as documented or talked about anymore. On the racial justice note, um, that is very important as a black person who's a wheelchair user. I have been, com I have been, com I've had comments on my posture in which I stand in my wheelchair and what commands attention and what seems threatening and non-threatening that even in a black body as a disabled black body based on how you posture yourself it can still be deemed as either threatening or non-threatening mm -hmm. so we have two comments here one from elizabeth one comment and another question mina miller was edison's second wife in which he explained I, i'm assuming he explained uh that touch uh touch, touch, um, I'm sorry, touch commentary we talked about. And what's the best way to refer to Edison in writing? Is it deaf with a capital D, deaf with a lower case D, or hard of hearing, or what's the best terminology? Sure. Um, so I should clarify that Edison was a learned telegraphy, learned Morse code as a young kid. So beyond his second wife and beyond that little anecdote about a proposal, he was very well versed in Morse code and, and used it to communicate in various ways starting as a kid. Um, yeah, I, I tend to write about, even though he was not what we would describe as deaf today, um, the language of impairment didn't come about until the 1910s and beyond because of the life insurance industry. The language of disability didn't become popularized until the 1910s and beyond because of workers comp. So if I'm writing a historical article and describing him using his own terms, I often do just use the term lowercase d deaf. That's what he used most often about himself. He also sometimes said semi-deaf, sometimes hard of hearing. He also used the term defect, defective hearing about himself. But the terms disabled and the terms impairment um, weren't, didn't, don't come up in his writing. Uh, and, and they just were, hadn't been popularized at that moment. Wonderful. All right. If you, if, if for the person who asked that question, if you're looking for a proper terminology in regards to disability, if you Google Lydia Brown, Autistic Hoya, she has an entire uh, glossary and definition of appropriate and ableist terminology. So oftentimes, um, the I, I guess hearing impaired is no longer considered acceptable because there's nothing impaired about them. So there's entire glossaries online that will also aid in how we write about disability. So there's uh, only a few minutes left, uh, just a, a, about three minutes. Um, but I wonder if uh, Beth and Mara, if you could both uh, reflect a little bit about um, the challenges of looking for uh, disabilities in traditional archives uh, and what that's like compared to um, if there was an archive that was built more around the exploration of disability history. Do you want me to start, Mara? Um... I don't actually don't think it's hard to find disability in the traditional archive. You know, I think it's, it's just a matter of we need more, we need disability to be more of a topic in history classes, um, social studies classes. And so people can start to recognize disability when they see it in the archive. So we just had two examples of pretty famous men who would not have necessarily identified as disabled, partly because um, that meaning of what disabled means changes over time. So part of uh, what I do and what Mara does in our undergraduate classes is to teach our students how 
to think historically, and sometimes that's looking at different terms, different terms that we would find offensive today, like crippled, like, you know, those, but you need to know those terms to see it in the archive. Um, so I think it's not that, the, the, the act of finding is not that challenging. It's the, it's a more kind of structural issue that we need to get more disability history in classrooms. That's a really good point about um, librarianship and indexing and search and cataloging and disability. Um, there are two librarians, Grayson Brillmeyer and um, Stephanie Rosen, who've written quite a lot about stigmatizing terms in uh, um, archiving and um, disability librarianship and, and how you need those search terms in order to be able to find disability in the past before the word disability was used before the word impairment was used. Um, and I really, I just recommend their work to think about all the pitfalls of, of librarianship um, and, and those terms as well. I think I agree with Beth, disability is everywhere. Um, as, and, you know, there are so many archives that people are, disability historians are returning to in disbelief that disability hadn't been pointed out um, in them before, like all, almost any techno mainstream technology archive one would, would goes to, the at and archives, Norbert Wiener's cybernetic archives, are filled with stories of disability. It's just because of ableism and the lack of disability studies as an academic field in the past, people ignored that material. Um, I, I do find it hard on some topics I work on to, again, to find firsthand accounts of everyday people. I'm a historian of technology, so everyday users of a technology. In those cases, I've often had to make my own archives. So for instance, the history of um, different reading machines that blind people have used, I've found older blind people, gone into their garages, interviewed them, collected their material, and it, because I wasn't able to find those stories in mainstream archives. But in general, there's a lot of disability in mainstream archives that people have just ignored or overlooked. It's been a pleasure. We had over 76 people on the call. I think this was a great success and I hope we continue to have these important discussions about historical archives and recognizing the disabilities of major, his, major history makers. Um, thank you all and I guess we will sign off and you guys have a wonderful evening. I just want to say also thank you, Ola, and thank you to our signers and transcribers uh, and all the people who helped make this, this program possible. So thank thanks to everyone who helped uh, behind the scenes and on the and on the screen.